The three laws of thermodynamics are going to be the topic of this lesson. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, in addition to high school and college science prep, we also do MCAT, DAT, and OAT prep. I'll leave a link in the description for where you can find those courses. Now, this lesson is part of my new general chemistry playlist. I'm releasing several lessons a week throughout the rest of this school year. So if you want to be notified every time I post one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. So the three laws of thermodynamics, the first law, the second law, the third law. So the first law was covered back in the first lesson on chapter five. So I'm gonna review it briefly, but because it has been covered previously in the course, uh, it's not often the most important of the three at this stage of the game. So that's usually gonna be reserved to the second law as we'll see. So the quick review of the first law here. So energy cannot be created or destroyed. Some people simply say the conservation of energy. It also, as we learned back in chapter five, can be expressed mathematically here. The change in internal energy of a system is equal to Q plus W. And it's like, well, this means that energy can't be created or destroyed. Actually, kind of it's implied. So uh, it doesn't seem so uh, initially so, but there's only two things in the universe, it turns out. Whatever you're looking at, and we'll call that the system, and then there's everything else, and we'll call that the surroundings. And so it turns out you can't just have energy all of a sudden appear in the system or in the surroundings. So because there's no new energy. So if you're getting new energy in the system, it had to come from the surroundings. And if you're getting new energy in the surroundings, it had to have come from the system. And so energy can be transferred between the system and the surroundings, So, but it just can't be created or destroyed. And so uh, it turns out energy can be uh, transferred in two different forms. And one of those is Q, and Q is heat transfer. And so in this case, if heat is transferred into the system, then the system is going to gain that heat. And that is when Q would be positive. So on the other hand, if heat is transferred out of the system to the surroundings, we always look at it with this equation from the perspective of the system. So in this second example, the system is actually losing the heat, it's losing energy, and so that's when we'd have negative Q. That's when Q would be a negative number instead. Now it turns out the other way that energy can be transferred into and out of the system is through mechanical work. And so we've got, again, same options here. So the system can gain energy as a result of work or the system can lose energy as a result of work. And if the system's gaining that energy, we would call that positive work. W would be a positive number. And if the system was losing energy, we'd call it negative work. And terminology we learned back in chapter five is that when the system is doing the work, just like if you do work, you're gonna use up some of your energy, you're gonna lose energy. So if the system is doing work, work is gonna have a negative value. So, and typically we, we, we phrase it that system is doing work on the surroundings. Now, the other way around though, if it's the surroundings doing work, well, what are the surroundings doing work on? Well, the only other thing that exists, the system. And so when the surroundings do work on the system, it's now the surroundings that's losing the energy, the system is therefore going to gain the energy and that would be positive work. Cool, went into a little more detail back in chapter five and uh, if you wanna go back over that, it's totally your prerogative. Uh, but that's the extent I just wanted to review it here, that's your first law. More important though at this stage is going to be the second law of thermodynamics. It's new to this chapter and it's the most commonly tested one uh, uh, at this stage of the game. So let's go over that second law. All right, so the second law of thermodynamics, there are three ways to phrase this that all start out very similar. They all start off saying for a spontaneous process and spontaneous process is just one that happens without the need for any work being put into the system. So spontaneous process, we'll get a little uh, better definition of that later in the chapter, but for now it's just a, a, a reaction or a process that happens without the need for the input of energy. So you can think of, uh, uh, you know, ice melting uh, when it's above zero degrees Celsius would be spontaneous, whereas ice melting when it's below zero degrees Celsius would be non-spontaneous, things of that sort. So things that happen naturally without help, those are spontaneous processes. All right, so where we gotta define here, those entropy here. So, and that's gonna be new to this chapter, and that's gonna be a big focal point of this chapter. In fact, the entire next lesson is going to be on entropy. Uh, so we'll get more into the nitty gritty of what entropy is in the next lesson. But for now, you're just gonna want to associate entropy with either random, randomness or disorder. Now, it turns out that entropy is not the same thing. It's not equivalent to randomness or disorder, but you're gonna to want to associate it. Because if the randomness or disorder in a system increases, then entropy is going to increase. And if randomness or disorder decreases, i.e. a system is becoming more ordered, then uh, entropy is going to decrease as well. So they're correlated with each other, but they're not, they're not exactly the same thing. So, But suffice it to say, if you can figure out that a, if a system is getting more disorder, more randomness, then it's gonna be getting an increase in entropy as well. 
All right, so second law. For a spontaneous process, the entropy of the universe increases. Now, there's a couple different ways, again, we can phrase this. And again, they're always going to start off with for a spontaneous process. So, but we can finish this in two other ways that essentially mean the same thing. So, so we've got the entropy of the universe increases. Well, another way to phrase that would be to say for a spontaneous process, that delta S of the universe is greater than zero. Again, that just means the change in entropy of the universe is a positive number. Well, it's just if it's, you know, if the change is positive, that means it's increasing. And that's why it means the same thing we said in the first one. So just another way of expressing it, make a little equation out of it. Last one, though, is going to again start off with for a spontaneous process. So, but it breaks up the universe into those two things we said existed when we talked about the first law. There's two things in the universe. There's whatever you're looking at, and we call that the system. And then there's everything else in the universe, and we call those the surroundings. And so in this case, and we could break up that change in entropy of the universe into the system and the surroundings which I'll abbreviate S-U-R-R, -R. and the total between the two, the sum between those two, has to be positive. And again, because the two of them combined are the entire universe. So if the delta S of the universe must be positive for a spontaneous process, well then system plus surroundings must be positive as well. Now notice that doesn't mean that the delta S of the system has to be positive all by itself, because if the delta S of the system is negative, that's actually okay. That happens all the time. So, but if the delta S of the system is negative, that means that the delta S of the surroundings for that spontaneous process would have to be even more positive. That way, when you add them together, you still get a positive number. So we start looking at this, we'll find out that when we talk about the delta S of a reaction in subsequent lessons, uh, when we talk about the delta S of a reaction, we're only looking at just the system. And the delta S of a reaction can be positive or negative. And in the next lesson, we'll learn how to predict, uh, you know, by looking at a reaction, whether it might be positive or negative in many cases. So, so just keep that in mind. Delta S of a reaction can be negative. So however, if you factor in also the surroundings on top of that for any spontaneous process, again, it always starts off for any spontaneous process, the delta S of the system plus the delta S of the surroundings will be a positive number. All right, so that's your second law. You're gonna to wanna to be able to, uh, you know, just verbatim know it in any one of these three ways. So all the words that definition are important. And again, it's the most commonly one you're going to be tested on. So, and then finally, we've got the third law of thermodynamics. So, and third law talks about a perfect crystal. And so a perfect crystal here, we're gonna talk about having no impurities. It is a single substance, there's no impurities. So, and it's in a perfect crystalline form where all the atoms or molecules occupy the exact crystal lattice positions they're supposed to. So a perfect crystal at zero, Kelvin has zero entropy. Cool, so you wanna memorize this as well and a little bit of an understanding you wanna get from this. So it turns out that uh, entropy is temperature dependent. As temperature goes up, randomness and disorder go up and so does entropy. And so it turns out as you cool, so uh, you know, any, pretty much any substance, as you cool them down, their entropy is going to decrease. And as you cool them down, it turns out you always hit this minimum point. So, and you kind of follow this line back on a curve and stuff like that, and you always hit this minimum point, and they all actually point back to the same minimum theoretical temperature, absolute zero Kelvin. And when they get there, that's the absolute minimum that that substance can have an entropy as well. And we give that value, if you can't have a lower entropy than that, well, then that's your zero point. So cool. And so it turns out if you take any perfect crystal and you cool it all the way down to absolute zero on the Kelvin scale, it has no entropy at that point. And we'll talk about this a little more in the next lesson when we uh, better define entropy and go through, you know, how we uh, can increase or decrease entropy and how predict it for different reactions. But suffice it to say for now, just memorize this definition after the next lesson, it'll make a little more sense. But those are your three laws. You need to memorize them and you need to recognize which one is the first and which one is the second and which one is the third law. So you need to recognize them by number. Super important. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, a like and letting me know in the comments. 
it's pretty much the best thing you can do to support the channel. And if you're looking for general chemistry practice materials, study guides, final exam rapid reviews, practice final exams, check out my general chemistry master course. I'll leave a link in the description. A free trial is available. Happy studying.